So uh, my name is Tom Stark and I run a uh, consultancy for financial systems, for mainly for automated trading systems. And um, in recent uh, years, with the onset of machine learning and AI and big data, you know, it's, it's kind of obvious that people think, well, how can we use this in finance? And um, really everyone, and this is how I got started in this field, in fact, when I uh, went uh, into it, uh, I thought, wow, the holy grail is to basically have a machine that trades on the stock market and makes you money while you're lying on the beach and do nothing. And um, it's a really uh, fun idea. Um, now, uh, in, in the days when I started, it was all about uh, signal-driven algorithms. So you had something like, oh, if this changes, uh, then I buy this particular stock or something like that. And nowadays, of course, you think, well, why don't I build a machine that does it all for me and I don't even have to worry about this anymore? So, um, you know, uh, machines, you know, trade. And, and the idea really is uh, for the machine to find an edge in the market and generate you a profit. So, yeah, the, uh, the obvious answer to this problem is uh, we just create the uh, AI system. But the obvious question is that comes uh, at the moment uh, to my mind working in this field and working with a lot of different companies in this, why hasn't anyone done it yet? Um, so what's actually happening right now is all this beautiful AI, people do amazing things with it. However, in finance, strangely enough, um, there isn't really any machines like that. There isn't anything that you switch on. It just trades the markets. It knows what it's meant to be doing and it just makes you money. So today I want to talk a little bit about where AI has already been used in finance. And I give you a bunch of examples. I hope some interesting ones. And I also want to talk about why has it not happened yet and what's the reasons for it and how can we possibly change that? Okay, so um, one of the uh, obvious main uh, things that, that really comes out of it is, is actually really not easy to do. Um, the problem space here is really, really different uh, from other applications in AI. And one of the biggest issues is that markets are really, really noisy. So unlike, say, in face recognition, when you get a nice crisp image generally of the person, when you look at markets and when you look at signals in markets, like in the price curves, there is so much noise that, in fact, it's virtually impossible a lot of the time to recognize the signals in the noise. And so what happens is what, what we're really seeing most of the time in the market is what we call a random walk. It's just randomly distributed uh, returns, so prices going up and down. And finding these faint signals in the noise is one of the first issues we need to solve. And AI is not particularly good at these things at the moment. Um, the other problem, which is also equally problematic and perhaps in the larger scheme of things even more so, is that whilst you apply, if, if you imagine you have an AI strategy, you apply that into the market and it's running fine, it'll actually change the market. It'll actually move the market. And if more players come, then all these people move the markets and it kind of defeats its own purpose. So imagine when you do face recognition and you actually do your face recognition and the person that you recognize the face with suddenly gets older in the face. It's about the same thing, right? And now try to, to think about this. You try to do face recognition. As soon as you do it, the person just automatically changes uh, his or her age. And at the same time, the image is incredibly blurry so that you can hardly see anything. This is what we're up against when we try to build autonomous uh, trading systems. And so, um, of course, um, we, you know, we, we already use uh, some of it in the market. So there's already a few uh, uses for AI in the market. Um, at the moment, though, they're mostly uh, addressing small subsets of the, actual, uh, of the actual problem space. And the first thing I want to do is to give you a, a wider perspective of what we're doing currently and what's currently happening. I, I, I explained to you a few of these things that already are, uh, have been done. And so there's a few things I talk about today, sentiment analysis, you probably all know that quite well. Then there's also interesting stuff like satellite imaging, training machines to act like human, 
And then um, there's one from my own personal experience. It's a fast pricing of complex derivative products. Um, so everyone kind of knows already sentiment analysis, and we use it in trading. We get, for example, uh, the news feed from Dow Jones or Twitter feeds or stock tweets. Uh, we do put that through a sentiment engine. I can see it's not quite round, um, so, so maybe the screen's a bit squashed. I apologize. And then we get sentiment. And hopefully, this will translate into a really positive profit curve. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people, because it's not that difficult to do, have already caught on to this. And what actually happens these days is that the uh, sentiment trails behind the actual market movement. So the market movements usually come first. Um, if you look at some of the more macro level things and longer term, then uh, you can see sentiment um, I'm still working. However, if you think, oh, you know, I pick up a news uh, article and then I quickly react, that usually doesn't work anymore. It worked still a few years ago, but now that have more and more people have caught onto it, it's actually, unfortunately, going away. Um, this is really interesting. This is about satellite imaging. And um, some people may have already heard about these examples, but um, I'd like to just uh, present some of them here anyway, because they're so cool. So I'll start with crop yield. Um, so a lot of people, they trade commodities like corn and, you know, whatever grows on fields. And so um, in Australia, where I'm from, traditionally, there's no reporting by the farmers uh, to a government body or anyone what they're actually planting. So in reality, no one actually knows what's on the fields, on the farmer's fields. You know, some farmer reported, but, but most of them don't. And so... You know, we could have cotton or we could have uh, uh, corn or, or whatever. No one really actually can quantify what it is. And the uh, harvesting season in Australia takes four months to go from the north to the south. And there's actually been a lot of confusion. Farmers don't know what everyone else is planting. So they're w wondering, well, do I get a good price for my products? Uh, the traders don't really know because they have to wait a few months until they, they pay for um, contracts and they have to pay for uh, a lot of money and wait a few months before they actually get what they want. Uh, then we have um, problems with uh, weather and, and with you know, droughts that minimize the yield. Um, so satellite imaging has helped in two ways. One is we can now determine the acreage for all the different crops. So we analyze the satellite images and we can see what different crops are actually planted. And the second part is uh, we can also determine what is the yield of that crop uh, or what's the expected yield of that crop. And now that enables governments, insurance companies, traders, and of course the farmers to make much more educated decisions about what they are going to plant when they do it. And so what that also means is everyone can minimize their risk to some extent. Um, the second one, which is really, really cool is, and that came up like about two, two or three years ago, um, a company started to take satellite images about the number of cars uh, parked outside of department stores in the US. And this particular example here is a company called JCPenney. And what they noticed is that over time, the um, number of cars parked outside dramatically dropped. And from that, they actually correlated that to the share price, and the share price was actually following that. And what they did is they actually predicted the demise of JCPenney, and I think they went into receivership in the end. So just by looking at the amounts of cars in the car parks with the satellite, they could actually make decisions on the market and on their trading in order to um, make money. Um, and the third one, which is also uh, quite interesting, oil trade is one of the massive, massive... Um, um, trading um, um, assets in the world that there's so much money flowing in and out of oil trade. And so companies naturally are interested into getting a good price. And so what they do here is they look at these oil tanks from a satellite and these oil tanks have lids that float up and down. They just sit there on top of the oil and they float. And so when you look from above and the sun comes in, you can see the shadows that the sun casts depending on how um, how far that lid is inside uh, the oil tank. And so you can actually determine 
uh, how much are these uh, oil storage spaces filled, and from that you can infer uh, where the price is going to move. This is something that used to be very, very difficult. No one actually really knew how much oil there was available. So for example, if, if you can see from your satellite, oh my god, all these uh, oil storage spaces are really shallow, you probably expect the price to go up because it's much more difficult uh, to get your hands on new oil. And so um, again, this was used quite successfully for trading. These days, everyone knows it, so it's more difficult. There was, was a question. The legal implications. Um, that, that's a long story. Maybe we can talk about this offline because um, there is obviously a lot of things. But but right now, you know, um, it, there still isn't really much of a framework with regards to that. It's actually really difficult for the regulators to make up their minds how, how they're gonna do this. And it's usually it usually comes in when the problem has already gone away. Um, that that's often what happens in finance. Um, the regulators are always 10 years behind the curve. So um, this, this is a really interesting uh, example also from my own work, um, human trained machines. So when we analyze um, 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 trading systems, what happens is um, we, we, we get a lot of outputs from, from the performance of these trading systems. And so um, there's like something called drawdown and sharp ratio and so on. And, and so, for example, here I've got this example. Uh, which of those two, these are two P and L curves, profit and loss. Wh which one of, the, they're almost finishing at the, same, um, um, at the same point, but which one would you uh, invest your money in, uh, this one or the blue one? Most likely in, in the blue one, right? Because it's just consistently up. This one, if, if that one trade here that makes all the money um, goes away, you, you know, you just don't make anything. You see all the rest is just losses. So you would go with this. Now, if you just express it as a number of your strategy being successful, they're almost equally successful. So that's not really a good way of doing this. However, it's still a p and L, you know, it's still the money you make. Now, there, there's other things like there's something called a drawdown, means like, oh, this, you know, how much money it, it loses uh, over, over, like from the highest point and so on. So there's quite a few metrics that are interesting in analyzing and, and evaluating the quality of a trading system. The interesting thing there is just simply ranking all those metrics and then putting them together really doesn't work. When you do this, you end up with really not very good systems. I mean, we've been through this exercise many times. Um, the other thing that you can do is build really complicated equations and, and, and where you say, well, if this increases a little, or if this is a bit higher and this is a bit lower, that's okay. But if this increases to, uh, or decreases to that level, but this is still up, then we don't want it. And, and it gets really complicated. And so um, what we started doing is simply getting all these metrics in a line on the screen and having someone manually uh, uh, scoring them and saying, oh, this is a five, this is a three, this is a six, and so on. And just train like a simple uh, machine learning uh, system with it. And then um, basically the machine learning system picks up the individual idea of um, um, how, this is, you know, how this is constructed. This is much, much quicker. You can train a machine like this in about half an hour much, much quicker than coming up with really complicated compound metrics and so on. And it's actually really fast as well. You can just run it through the machine learning tool. You've done it. And yeah, so we found uh, these human trained systems are extremely helpful and give us a, a machine based individual perspective on what we want to achieve. Okay, another one uh, from my own work, uh, fast derivative pricing. Um, so derivative pricing is a bit of an interesting thing. People have won Nobel Prizes, and the same people that won the Nobel Prizes in derivative pricing then had the biggest capital meltdown of their company in the history of the American stock market. So they won, there was a book called When Genius Failed or something. There was a lot of things about it. So it's actually quite a difficult problem, and it involves some complex mathematics. Um, and nowadays, we have these things called exotic options, and they are even more complicated to price. I remember I once, um, I didn't even make those mathematical models up myself, but I had a paper, 20 pages of equations, 
And then uh, it took me about four weeks to even just take the equations and put them in a system, fixing a few errors in the process. But, you know, some, some PhD has made up the model um, um, years ago and, and, you know, it took him probably three years to do. Now, the issue with this was I built this model, it took me a few weeks, and then a few weeks later they changed the way those specific options that I used worked and the whole thing was completely gone. Like I couldn't use it anymore. And I got so frustrated, I said, I'm not going to come up with another mathematical model. So what we did was put, uh, use basically a very pragmatic solution, trained a neural network with the prices as they come in from the market and, and all the parameters. The problem with this is when our parameters go out of scope, when they go into a range that we haven't trained, we can't use this neural network. So we have to do what you call Monte Carlo simulations. They're generally quite slow, but we can see when our stuff goes out of scope, we can start performing them preemptively and then actually do a pricing model based on Monte Carlo and then feeding that back in our neural network uh, to be able to make more predictions. And then if it act, as it actually comes into the scope of these new um, parameters, uh, we can then feed the real prices in the AI as well and then get a better sense of what's happening. And so this system, um, which is it's basically involves no equations whatsoever, is actually really fast and efficient for good derivative pricing. And, you know, I was involved in high frequency trading and speed there is really, really important. And so uh, this was a, like a very pragmatic solution um, using uh, machine learning. So the big question for most people is, and this is in trading, we have reinforcement learning. What about that? How, you know, couldn't we just take a trading system and then plug in our reinforcement learner and hope it's going to build us an amazing strategy that, that will really uh, just solve all our problems and trade profitably until the end of days? Um, well, there is actually uh, a few stumbling blocks uh, to this, and this is really where we come to this. Have we? Are we already there uh, in, in, in terms of autonomous trading machines? Um, one of the problems with reinforcement learning is it's very simple and efficient. So um, we, even if we have tens or hundreds of thousands or even millions of price data, it's still um, not enough to really train um, reinforcement learners efficiently uh, as, as far as the current technology goes. And so when we train them, we, don't, we have to do this on, on the same price data over and over again, which basically leads to complete overfitting. And everyone here knows probably what that leads to, and there's no way you can actually use that out of sample. So um, one of the other problems with reinforcement learning is, and for the, for the people here that know this, uh, we've got a reward function in, in our reinforcement learning. And when I showed you earlier what we did with machine learning, where we use human-informed um, uh, metrics, um, this is the same problem here with the reward function. What are we using? Profit and loss, profit and loss per time step, uh, risk-adjusted profit, uh, max drawdown, or all of them at the same time. It's actually really hard to um, come up with a good reward function in finance. It, it seems such an obvious problem. You just say, oh, whatever makes the most money is what we use, but it's really not. Um, it it's actually leads to some really bad decisions to be made um, from experience. Um, another problem is, um, and this is also an issue with the uh, reinforcement learner, it's the uh, exploit, uh, exploitation problem uh, versus exploration. When we build uh, reinforcement learners that we want, them, we want them to make good money, we really need to be in the exploitation space of the reinforcement learning, meaning we don't want to have too many uh, random jumps that, that just search the space and look around because they are usually the least profitable ones. So when we are in the exploitation space, what happens is our um, neural network will very quickly converge into some sort of local uh, minimum. And what that means is, as the market changes, as we get like a different market characteristic, so in, in, in finance we talk about mean reversion versus trending and so on, as, as we get into a different market characteristic, it's really, really difficult for the reinforcement learner 
to jump out of that local minimum and actually adapt to the new market conditions. And the other thing is it's actually also really difficult to even tell when the market conditions change. It's, it's still fairly obvious often for a human, um, but for a machine, there is not really any easy solutions yet. If you come up with one, I'd be really grateful to see it. Of course, in hindsight, it's always easy, but actually when you're, um, when you're running it live, it's very, very difficult to pick up when the market conditions really change. So um, the other problem is reinforcement learners really don't deal uh, with noise very well. Um, this is an interesting one because when you are able to reduce the noise a little bit with some filters, um, you can actually start to see really good results. And um, in, when, uh, a while ago, I was at QuantCon in New York and I presented um, a little paper on this, and there is a, a GitHub um, page um, where I have a really basic example of a trading um, um, reinforcement learner. And it's based on the same uh, reinforcement learning techniques that people use to crack games, you know, when you have like really simple games and then uh, the machine learns how to win the game, basically. This is based on a similar thing. And if you take the noise out to some extent, you will actually realize suddenly that the reinforcement learners start to work fairly well. Again, uh, it's not easy to just go from noise filters to profitable strategies. So we're working on that and I'll keep you updated. Um, it's very interesting problems. So um, what's interesting is, and I've seen this many times in this space, AI gurus came in, they say, Whoa, we just use AI on trading and, oh yeah, we're gonna make bucket loads of money. Funny enough, um, pretty much all of them have failed. Um, most AI-driven new hedge funds and so on, they all have failed, like most of them actually never made it. And why, are, why is this? This is, this is really, um, it's really strange, you know, because, you know, it should be a fairly easy problem, um, at least from the outset, but, but it's, it's really not, um, because, the, 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 the single most uh, um, biggest mistake that a lot of people make that enter that space, and you see a lot of like blog posts on that, they try to predict prices, but not returns. And actually predicting prices is, you know, if you are at 150, uh, you can kind of predict, well, it's 151 or 149, pretty much kind of similar. And, and if you do this over, over lots of prices, it looks like your prediction is really closely tracking the prices, but actually, it doesn't really mean much whether you predict prices or not. What you really want to predict is returns because if you predict the price closely, um, what, what you really care about is it going up or is it going down. If you predict it slightly up but it's going down, there's no point, like you lose money. And if you do this consistently, even if you predict the prices closely, you most of the time lose or actually what happens most of the time is just a, basically when you look at the distribution, it's just a random blob. It isn't, there's hardly any predictive value in it. Um, so that, that's the biggest mistake a lot of people make that enter the field when they are new. Um, the other thing is, and, and I want to stress this because uh, my, um, the previous speaker said, oh, more data are much better. Now, interestingly, in finance, it's not like that, uh, not quite. When you use trading systems, what we found is often machine learning works better with less training data. That's really fascinating because nowhere in, 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 in data science generally, that, that, that's, that's the gospel, more data is always better. The problem here is machines as we know them right now always uh, get trained on specific market conditions and they converge on specific market movements. And if those market movements change, the machine has to change. And it doesn't understand that necessarily. So what happens is when you look back too far, the machine just tries to cater for all the market conditions and basically just gets really confused and produces really confusing results. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When you narrow down the number of data that you use to train the machine, update that frequently, you actually get much better results. Now, Sometimes that depends also on what you look at, but in most cases, in my experience, th this is true. Um, often what people forget is trading costs. 
There's something called spreads and commissions and slippage. They really cut into your profit. And you see a lot of academic papers, they do all this machine learning and they go, yeah, you know, like we have we're really successful. What they forgot is to include all the hidden costs of trading. And then actually, if you apply them as well, their uh, systems usually completely die and there's not much, uh, not much to be gained anymore. Um, now, what's really important here is, and, and I, I guess that this is what people have recognized now, just knowing AI systems isn't enough. You need domain specific knowledge. You need to understand which domain you're working in. And I just realized recently, I did a bit of natural language uh, uh, processing and I realized, oh my God, I don't even remember the grammar from school very well. And you, I really had to like relearn a lot of the, you know, the way language is constructed and so on. I, I've really forgotten it. And, and obviously, if you have that domain specific knowledge, it would be much easier for you to build natural language system. But if you come in fresh, it will take you quite some time to pick up all the little things that, that might be there that, that you've forgotten. Like in, in, in the case of finance, it's definitely trading costs and all those other things. So domain specific knowledge is not easy to gain. And as far as I can see here and the people I talk to, mostly data scientists, they start in a specific area and then they become data scientists in this area. The, the generalistic data scientists, in my opinion, doesn't really exist um, because it's just too difficult to get that specific knowledge and takes too long a lot of the time. So um, the other problem is uh, good traders often, what they do nowadays, they recognize really machine learn, like simple machine learning generated trading patterns. They can actually look at the chart and they go, oh, this is a machine and I trade against it. And what they do is they recognize when you run your machine, they see the pattern over time if it starts repeating and they trade against it and they basically make you lose money by just making manual decisions. Their neural networks are pretty powerful as well. So, <laughs> and, and, and they're very good reinforcement learners. So um, when you build these machines and they just do simple stuff, uh, people will recognize it and they will go against you. And again, wipes you out. So uh, the final thing is, of course, you, you're up against some very smart people. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, you always talk about the PhDs and the, you know, uh, Harvard and MIT guys. So it, it's, it's pretty tough space because as I said before, everyone wants to build machines that make money. So there's a lot of people moving in and there's a lot of crowding nowadays. So um, are we there yet? Well, AI is definitely on the rise. There's a lot of AI moving into finance at the moment. However, for autonomous self-learning machines, in my opinion, it's still a long way to go. There's still quite a bit of work to do. Um, it's not quite that simple yet. Um, I think we will get there, but and some people have had success, but it's incredibly difficult. So um, finally, I want to say thank you. I, I just found this uh, in Trader Life, which is an online magazine. I found someone quoted me. I think that the markets will definitely become more efficient through AI. It will definitely become a bit of robot wars. I think this is what is going to happen. It's going to become robot wars. Um, if you want to contact me, here's my email address and my website. Um, and if you have any questions, just come and ask me afterwards. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have about uh, five minutes. Yeah, All right. Okay. So um, um, this gentleman was first, and I go to you. Yep. So hi, my name is Deepak. Some of the things you talked about uh, using AI in finance, I could relate to because yep. I was doing similar work in Morgan Stanley. Uh huh. And uh, I remember that when we were building this kind of system uh, to trade in fixed income bonds, yes, uh, we figured out that, oh no, that was for actually equities. We found out that the biggest problem was coming from uh, hidden liquidity and uh, hidden orders. Do you know what hidden orders are? H yeah, uh, hidden orders? Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, there is, um, uh, so what, what you're talking about is a hidden liquidity in the market. Now with new machines, people don't submit orders anymore. They watch the market and just yeah. in the moment, when the market, um, you know, when they want to trade, they put the order in. So suddenly, like, you, you, you think you understand the market, but then suddenly there's all this other stuff coming in. And this is actually another big problem you're up against. You don't really know anymore uh, uh, what the market's actually really like. So this was the problem that actually uh, helped us die 
we didn't uh, go forward because you are not able to overcome yes. because you are uh, you, you look very learned in finance and you have background just yeah. wanted to understand did you solve this problem or what um, was your approach well um there is certain ways you don't need to solve this problem um um it it depends on on the algorithms you build but it's definitely not easy to overcome this um but as i said we found ways around that as well i'm actually working with a company that does bonds trading so we're, we're in that space but, but there's unfortunately a lot of proprietary information, so it's kind of hard to talk about this. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, you had a question. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I? sorry. Okay. Can I go ahead? You're next. <laughs> um, um, yeah, maybe maybe you, you ask quickly, and then or you got the microphone. So this gentleman was first. So my question is, uh, I know in short term, the market is quite volatile, it's difficult to predict. Yes. So what's your view on a uh, slightly long term? When I say slightly long, it's like three months, six months, one year down the line, mm -hmm. based on uh, your previous price, your fundamentals, yep. your returns, and all those things. So what's your view on that? Very, very good question. In my opinion, the, the real short term mark trading, mark trading is so crowded now that it's actually, for, especially for newcomers, almost impossible to come in and to actually be profitable. And I think the future of, of, of new people moving into the market is in the longer time frames. And um, in fact, I really believe that, that we are, you know, we, we move from like slow trading to like high frequency trading in the nanosecond range, but now it's actually coming back. And a lot of trading firms also are moving back to more long-term trading. And, predicting the market like a few days out, a few weeks out, a few months out. And yes, I, I really, I mean, myself, I, I'm looking more and more into this again. And I can really see that there's a lot of potential still because there's, there's still companies, you know, why, why is the market going up eventually? It's because companies are creating value, right? And, and like if you find machines that, that understand how value is created, you can uh, trade that. And that's never really going to go away. Uh, so, so yes, I believe that's that's really um, the future, in my opinion. Um, one yeah. gentleman yeah. over there. Uh, yeah. My question is more of a suggestion than uh, clearing any doubts. Uh, I was going through your slide on uh, why AI-based machines normally get things wrong. Yeah. I feel one another parameter out of it. I mean, in addition to those who have, in addition to those that you have mentioned. Yes would be the contextual inputs. Uh -huh. yep. okay. So the contextual inputs also will help you in uh, better prediction rates. Of course, yes. And uh, I feel that also has to be added in addition to whatever that you have yes, uh, mentioned. Yes. I mean, um, as I said, there is, there is so many ways you can do this. And it actually really depends on the time frame that you're trading on, whether certain inputs are more or less important. And so, um, Sometimes, you know, uh, there's act there would actually be a lot of merit in using AI for high frequency trading. But unfortunately, um, AI systems are way too slow. That's, that's the main um, stumbling block. You, you know, um, you need to make nanosecond decisions. If you run this through a neural network, it's way too slow. So it's also, it's, it's very uh, important to see what you're dealing with on a technological end. And then, um, you know, there, there's so many ways to play this uh, contextual. Um, nowadays, there's a mantra, don't use price anymore for predictions. Uh, alternative data are really big. But now even alternative data are already becoming a bit of a commodity. So at the moment, it's constantly changing, always new stuff. It's, it, and you always have to stay on top of the game, which, which I find exciting. So, so it's good. Um, there was a question. Over Hello? There. Oh. Here. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I think uh, she was first, so, so uh, afterwards. Yeah, just a quick question. Okay. Um, how do we decide uh, at what point should we deploy a model in real time? Uh, uh, say that again, so, please. Given so many caveats about whether a model is performing or not performing, Yes. at what point we decide that, okay, this model is mature enough to be deployed? That's a really good question. And actually, so many people have philosophized about it, and there is really no solution. Some people say, don't over philosophize about your, your, uh, about your performance. Just, just build something, get it in the market and start running. Other people are extremely diligent and they just try to be um, perfect and they end up in analysis, paralysis. But there is actually no real, um, 
how should I? It, it's still gut feeling. There, there is no real systematic way of doing that. Um, ha, ha, sorry, I, I couldn't. Uh, being a data scientist, how yeah. do we influence the decision of putting the model in production and have confidence that it will work over time? Um, I think a lot of this is when you've done this for many, many times over and over again and you saw what happened as you did it, you get more experience in it. That's usually the way we do it still. Um, I, to be honest, I haven't got a better answer for that. I haven't found a systematic way of doing it properly. Um, there was a question over there. Uh, I have a doubt regarding this fraud detection in financial accounting because like uh, detecting frauds in financial accounting there involves a lot of metrics and you need to have a strong domain knowledge in financial accounting Yes. and frauds especially in financial accounting they have a huge impact in stock prices and markets. Yes, well. of course. Yes. So like uh, what is the advancements of AI in that field? I'm not able to find a lot of literature in this field particularly. But yeah, what is the advancements in that field? Well, I mean, I can only talk uh, for my domain, which is trading, not so much uh, financial accounting. And, and so, I mean, in Australia, for example, ASIC and, and also the NASDAQ, they, they got systems that detect fraudulent trading, like there's something called spoofing and wash trading and pump and dump and all these things. Okay. So there's actually a bunch of AI systems now deployed by the regulators that start detecting this. And it actually becomes quite serious. When you breach those, um, you can really get into a lot of trouble. So it's, it's actually constantly evolving uh, as well. Unfortunately, regulators generally don't have as much money as the big financial firms. So it seems like they're always a step ahead. And unfortunately also, in, especially in Australia, there's quite revolving doors. The people that work for ASIC then work for trading firms and they understand what to do to get around things. And it's just an ongoing issue that's just Probably never going to get resolved. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, do we have more time? No, no. We if, have. Probably run out of time, but yeah. prescribe me afterwards. I'm, I'm outside. You can just ask me the questions there. <laughs>